Thank you for listening to Lone Star Community Radio. This program was broadcasted and recorded live from the LSCR studios in downtown Conroe, Texas. Lone Star Community Radio is supported by listeners like you. Donate and sponsor today. For more information on getting involved with Lone Star Community Radio, contact us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or visit us online at www.irlonestar.com. Hi, welcome to the Legal Connection Show. I'm Tony Collins, an attorney in Conroe and uh, licensed in Texas. Uh, the Legal Connection Show can be heard on FM 104.5 and FM 106.1 um, within the bandwidth of Montgomery County. And you can also catch us on the LegalConnectionShow.com um, if you uh, missed this broadcast or want to re-listen to it. Um, you can also get uh, any of our shows on IRLoneStar.com by going to the website and then looking for the Legal Connection Show and um, most, if not all, the shows that we have done over the last couple of years um, are um, in order by week uh, for you to listen to. The uh, show airs every Tuesday at noon. And uh, last week, we went over Roe versus Wade because it's uh, currently in the, uh, the media and the Supreme Court. Uh, it became uh, kind of a popular topic on uh, uh, many of the news channels because the first draft of a Supreme Court case that may overturn it was leaked. And um, I read last week part of Roe versus Wade to kind of understand it because I really didn't know the background of it. And this week we're going to go over uh, the other the, the fine points, a little update um, uh, uh, of Roe v. Wade. Um, on when it was passed back in 1972, not passed, but when it was when the opinion came out, and then we're going to go over the leaked uh, opinion that uh, just came out. In that case, is Dobbs v. Jackson. Um, Thomas E. Dobbs, uh, uh, actually, to be more specific, it is Thomas E. Dobbs, State Health Officer of the Mississippi Department of Health at L. versus Jackson's Women Health Organization. And uh, this is the case that was written by Judge uh, Alito and has not been officially, um, I guess, published uh, to the public. But there's been, you know, people protesting in front of the Supreme Court justices' homes and um, a lot of stuff going on in the media. So we're going to uncover the mystery and uh, kind of give you just the facts on that. All right. So as a, a brief recap, uh, Roe v. Wade was a 1971 uh, landmark decision. Actually, it was in the courts from 71 to 73 uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court. It ruled that a state law in Texas that banned abortion was unconstitutional. This was a Texas case. It was brought from the Dallas, Fifth, uh, not the Dallas District Court and then heard in the Fifth Circuit. Um, it was actually, uh, uh, I'm trying to, I can't remember what the procedural uh the procedural process was for it, but I believe that the uh, district court ruled in favor of uh, the uh, uh, the district court ruled in favor of uh, the abortion clinic the the, the in, for, in favor of uh, Texas, and then I believe the Fifth Circuit reversed that, and then the Supreme Court reversed them. So it ended up that they determined that. Uh, it was un uh, the t state law was unconstitutional in not allowing abortions before the fifteenth week, and um, okay, so uh, the decision divided the United States and is still controversial. People became divided into pro-life versus pro-choice groups. This was fifty years ago. Pro-life supporters argue that the unborn baby has the same right to life as other people, and the government should intervene to protect that life. Pro-choice supporters believe that an unborn baby is not the same as a person, and the woman has the right to choose what she wants to do with her own body, and the government should not intervene. Roe was limited by a later decision, Webster versus Reproductive Health in 1989, which allowed the regulation of abortion in some cases. Several states have considered the laws, have considered laws banning abortions altogether. And, um, Recently, um, Texas and Alabama, and I think Mississippi, have come up with some really strong anti-abortion laws. 
Um, so here's the background. Then I'm giving you a little bit more information about the people involved so you can sort of understand uh, what was going on then and the history of what happened with them. Um, the case began in 1970 in Texas as a challenge against the law banning any kind of abortion unless the mother's life was in danger. A pregnant Texas woman, Norma McCorvey, um, and they called her Jane Roe as opposed to Jane Doe, to protect her identity, um, brought a lawsuit against Henry Wade, the Dallas County District Attorney, in federal court. Claiming to be a single woman and pregnant, McCorvey wanted to terminate her pregnancy. She wanted it done safely by a doctor, but said that she could not afford to travel outside Texas, which is a little bit weird because Dallas is right outside of Oklahoma and Arkansas, and so she probably could have traveled outside of Texas. But that wasn't the point, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Ultimately, it was a bunch of very liberal young attorneys who needed a pregnant woman to be their their plaintiff in a case to uh, make a stand against abortion, anti-abortion laws, and she fit the bill. Um, so anyway, she could not get a legal abortion in Texas because her life was not in danger. And I believe that um, in at, at the time, she tried to claim that her life was in danger, but um, they the district court had asked for evidence of that, and the doctors would not lie for her. Um, and she had to have a doctor's uh, a permit saying that her life was in danger. Her lawsuit claimed that Texas law violated her right to privacy, protected by the 1st, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments. Roe added she sued on behalf of herself and all other women in the same situation. The case uh, made its way to the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, McCorby had her baby and placed it up for adoption. And I'm just going to add that, uh, you know, it, it said that there was an argument for the 1st, 4th, 5th, ninth, and 14th Amendments. But I always saw this case as being a 10th Amendment rights issue, states versus federal. And we're going to get into that a little bit, too, because I believe that that was the core of the uh, determination of the draft. That was their, their core argument in the draft that was leaked for this year, 50 years later, that the state should have the rights to decide. Um, so anyway, the case slowly made its way to the Supreme Court. Before we had a baby, she placed it for adoption. Um, it was a majority opinion back in 1972. The court held that a woman's right to an abortion was protected by her right to privacy under the 14th Amendment. The decision allowed a woman to decide whether or not to have an abortion during the first trimester, which is the first 15 weeks. Um, that affected the laws of 46 states. So in other words, um, the Supreme Court broke the, they sort of made new law by establishing that the first trimester was a woman's right to do whatever she wanted with her body. The second trimester, I think that there was some gray area. In the third trimester, they said that the baby was viable and that that unless there was a danger, that, that they, the, it wasn't unconstitutional to prohibit an abortion at that point. Uh, Justice Harry Blackman wrote the majority opinion, um, and he is, I, I learned, uh, uh, like many of the justices of 50 years ago, is no longer alive. Um, we, acknowledge our aware, we acknowledge our awareness of the sensitive and emotional nature of the abortion controversy, of the vigorous opposing views, even among physicians, and the deep and seemingly absolute convictions that the subject inspires. Uh, and this was a quote from him in 1973. The dissenting opinion was written by William Justice William Rehnquist, who disagreed with the majority for several reasons. And here are the four reasons that he gave. He first pointed out that there was no legitimate plaintiff in the case, uh, so there was no standing, which was a requirement to hear the case. A legitimate plaintiff would be a woman in her first trimester of pregnancy at some point while the case was being tried. McCorvey did not fit that qualification because she'd already had the baby. And so ruling had no application to the case. Second, the court recognized a woman's right to abortion under the general right to privacy from the previous cases. However, he argued, a transaction such as this was hardly private in the ordinary use of the word. Um, particularly because she didn't have standing and because they were making such a big um, um, argument before the Texas Supreme Court. Of, I mean, Texas, not well, not Texas Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, because they brought it in federal court, so it didn't go to the Texas uh, Supreme Court. Um, the majority opinion was vague on the exact place of the right to privacy in the Constitution. 
several amendments were amended, but none was specifically identified to, I'm sorry, several amendments were mentioned, but none was specifically identified to contain the right to privacy. In fact, the word privacy is not even found in the Constitution. Fourth, additional problems included the court acting as a legislature in dividing pregnancy into three trimesters and outlining the permissible restrictions the states may make. He pointed out that 36 of the 37 states in 1868, when the 14th Amendment was passed, had laws against abortion, including Texas. The only conclusion possible was that this history is that the drafters did not intend to have the 14th Amendment withdraw from the states the power to legislate without respect to this matter. So, um, and and that goes, again, toward not only that the Constitution didn't have a 14th uh, it didn't mention the word privacy, but that it wasn't a private matter. That uh, that Steri Decisis basically said that 37 of 36 of the 37 states in 1868. Remember, we didn't have 50 states back then, so that was a, 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 a almost a complete majority of the states um, didn't allow abortion, and that it wasn't a right that was delineated or um, allowed that the, 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 the federal courts could hear, and that's the Tenth Amendment argument, which wasn't even brought up, um, which is what's brought up in this uh, new uh, draft that's, uh, that we're going to go over briefly today. Um, so um, without getting into uh, you know, everything that went over last week, I will say that the, uh, the trimester concept in its decision, we're going to talk about that just briefly, in its decision, the court used three trimester framework, a three trimester framework for pregnancy. During the first trimester, an abortion was safe for the mother, safer for the mother than childbirth. The reasoning was that the decision whether to get an abortion at that stage should be left up to the mother to decide. Um, in law, that interfered with abortions in the first trimester would be presumed to be unconstitutional. During the second trimester, the laws would regulate abortion only to protect the health of the mother. During the third trimester, the unborn child was viable, able to live on its own, outside the mother's womb. Then, laws could restrict or prohibit abortions unless it was necessary to preserve the mother's health. The doctrine stood until 1992 when Planned Parenthood versus Casey had co the court now based the legality of an abortion no longer on trimesters but on fetal viability. And that was, um, you know, 30 years ago. And so since then, we've had, you know, technology that's made, you know, the viability of the child, uh, you know, a, a more of a focal point. But in the opinion that I'm going to, the, the leaked opinion that I'm going to read you, they really focus more on whether it was actually unconstitutional. That was the only way that they got this case into federal court. They knew back in 1972 that Texas was very conservative and that they would probably wouldn't have a very good case relative to overturning a law in Texas that was clear. It wasn't, un it wasn't ambiguous. They instead attacked its constitutional, uh, it, whether or not it was constitutional, and that's how it was overturned. Um, now they're looking at whether the 14th Amendment was even the right road work, the right path to un be, it being unconstitutional. They used, you know, so many of the amendments, but not the right one. And if they'd used the right one, the 10th Amendment, it would have been overturned long ago. Um, the 10th Amendment gives the states the right, just like with gun control, to determine whether or not um, their abortion laws, um, it, it, to legislate them and let the people decide, not um, the federal government based on the Constitution. All right, so um, a little background on the case before we get into the um, the actual Supreme Court case that just came out um, that was leaked uh, that I thought was really interesting about Norma McCorvey, who was Jane Doe. And I, I was kind of curious to see, was she still alive? I mean, she was having a baby back in 1970. Many people that had children in 1970 are still alive. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are, you know, in their early 50s, and they're uh, a lot. In fact, I know people in the early 50s that that actually have still are having babies through surrogates. And that's sort of a, a little sidebar. I was just reading the paper that um, Lyle Lovett uh, just became a father, 
at the age of 60. And um, he was born in uh, Houston, uh, brought up in Klein, Texas. His great-great-grandfather was uh, the, uh, the person that established Klein, Texas. He was a German um, immigrant. His last name was Klein. I don't know what his first name was. Um, but Law Lovett is his great-great-great-grandson. Klein, Texas is right next to Tomball. Klein, Texas is like Bel Air. It's a small sort of enclave within the Houston metropolitan area. It's not some place that's way out in the country somewhere. It's actually uh, like a suburb of Houston. And um, so uh, La Lovett was married to Julia Roberts for two years. I thought that was kind of interesting. They met. They eloped after three weeks, but the marriage didn't last. Surprise, surprise, with Julia Roberts. And um, they didn't have any kids. And so he went on the next year to meet um, a girl named, um, I believe it was Christine, uh, it might have been April, Christine Kemble, but her name was, uh, last name was Kemble. And um, so they started dating, um, but here's the catch. She was 21, he was 41. And um, so they started uh, dating. There was a 20-year age difference, roughly. Might have been more than that. She was born in 75. He was born in 57. So, uh, let me see, 55, 75, uh, 18 or 19-year difference. And so, anyway, um, they uh, were got engaged in 2003, and then they got married in 2017 in Harris County. Um, so, that's a long relationship for not being married. So, they got married in 2017 because she was getting ready to give birth to his first children, some twins. So he is now the proud father of four-year-old twins at the age of 64. And um, I just thought that was so uh, interesting that she gave birth, natural childbirth at like 42, and um, they have twins and he's 64. Uh, he's now got an album out called June 12th, because that was the date his children were born in 2017. And um, he said that it was the most fun that he's ever had. He did, he did not think having children would be so much fun. And he's written all of these songs about them, like pants are overrated and, and various other things. But I just thought it was interesting that um, you can't, uh, you know, kind of from age to age, you while well, you might think that he's a grandfather, he's actually a new father. His mother, I think he said, was 97. So he was born sort of late too. So... Uh, when you look at Roe versus Wade, um, you know, abortion, uh, childbirth, how old people are, uh, you really can't put it in, into a, a square peg into a circle or vice versa. So, or however that saying goes. So I decided to look up Norma McCovey, not discounting that she might still very well be alive. And she is not. Um, she died in 2017 at the age of 69. She should still be alive, but she had kind of a hard life. And here was her background. Norma Lee Nelson McCorvey, um, is also known by her pseudonym Jane Roe, was the plaintiff in the landmark American legal case Roe v. Wade, in which the Supreme Court ruled in 73 that individual state laws banning abortion were unconstitutional. Later in her life, McCorvey became an evangelical Protestant, and in remaining years, she became a Roman Catholic and took part in anti the anti-abortion movement. Corby stated that her involvement in Roe was the biggest mistake of her life. During an interview shortly before her death, in what McCorvey referred to as her deathbed confession, she said that she had been paid to speak against abortion and that she continued to have um, abortion rights beliefs. So she's just all over the board. Um, you would think she would speak against abortion because she was the Roe in Roe versus Wade that was against that 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 advocated that abortion should be legal, and then she's saying she's being paid to speak against it. So that didn't make sense because that was kind of a, a 180 degree turn. Um, it ends up that. Um, you know, and when I read through her entire sort of life story, she really didn't have a position on it. She said people should have the right to do whatever they want to do. She wasn't for it. She wasn't against it. She had a number of children. She had, I, want, I wanted to know what happened to the child that she had in 1970 that she gave up for adoption. Um, actually, the Inquirer found her and interviewed her, and she was none too happy about that either. Uh, but here's just a little bit of background on her. She died in Katy, Texas. She lived basically in Dallas in the Houston area, so she was local. Um, she was born in Louisiana. 
Uh, she was raised in a residence in uh, P- Point Coupe, Louisiana. Uh, her family moved to Houston. Uh, he was a TV repairman. Uh, she uh, and her brother were raised by her mother, who was a violent alcoholic. Her father died in 95. Her mother was raised Pentecostal. Uh, but Norma's father led her and the family as uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So she was just, I mean, this was just a situation where there wasn't a place where I guess she felt loved and needed. Um, so, uh, McCorvey had minor troubles with the law that started at the age of 10 when she robbed a cash register at a gas station and ran away to Oklahoma with a friend. They tricked a hotel worker into letting her stay there uh, and rent a room. She was there for two days when a maid walked in on her and her female friend, um, the, uh, let me see, it says, uh, our remember friend kissing. Um, McCorvey was arrested, taken to court, where she was declared a ward of the state, and her mother sent her to Catholic boarding school, even though she didn't become a Catholic at that point. She became a Catholic in 1998. Later, she was sent to the state school for girls in Gainesville, on and off from the ages of 11 to 15. She said this was the happiest time of her childhood. And every time she was sent home, she would purposely do something bad to be sent back. After being released, McCorvey lived with her mother's cousin, who allegedly raped her every night for three weeks. So this was just, it just went from bad to worse. I mean, she had a a sad childhood, an alcoholic mother. She didn't feel like she belonged anywhere. Uh, Her favorite, she felt most at home with other troubled girls in a, uh, a place where they were holding her as a juvenile delinquent. And then when she was released, um, she was, whether she was raped or not, you know, and being a criminal defense attorney, I always have to ask, was this something that she was persuaded to do or was she actually raped? Because usually when people are raped, they don't, at that age, just like she had done, she could leave again. She doesn't have to stay there at that age. But Regardless, um, she's not here to defend that anymore because she died in 2017. It says, um, while she was working at a restaurant, Norma met Woody McCorvey, and she married him at the age of 16 in 1963. She later left him and, and he, after he allegedly assaulted her. She moved in with her mother and gave birth to her first child, Melissa, in 1965. After Melissa's birth, McCorvey developed a severe drinking and drug problem. Soon after, she began identifying as a lesbian. In her book, she stated that she went on a weekend trip to visit two friends and left her baby with her mother. When she returned, her mother had replaced Melissa with the baby doll and reported Norma to the police as having abandoned her baby, called the police to take her out of the house. She did not tell her where Melissa was for four weeks. She finally let her visit the child after three weeks. She allowed um, Norma to move back in. One day she woke up and McCorvey, uh, she woke up McCorvey after a long day at work. She told McCorvey to sign what were presented to her as insurance papers, and she did so without reading them. However, the papers she had signed were actually adopted papers, giving her mother custody of Melissa. McCorvey was then kicked out of the house, and her mother disputes this version of events uh, and and said that McCorvey agreed to the adoption. The following year, McCorvey became pregnant again and gave the baby up for adoption. The baby was Jennifer, who was placed um, also for adoption. And so... What came about was um, basically her mom adopted a child. She had already two, two kids before she was 21. Um, in 1968, at the age of 21, McCorvey became pregnant again for the third time and returned to Dallas to live with, I guess, with her mother. I'm not sure where she lived. It just returned to Dallas. Um, according to McCorvey, friends advised her that she should assert falsely that she had been raped by a group of black men and that she could therefore obtain a legal abortion under Texas law, which prohibited most abortion. Um, Sources differ on whether Texas law had such a rape exception at that time. However, that's what she had tried to do. Due to a lack of police evidence or documentation, the scheme was not successful and McCorvey later said that it was a fabrication. She attempted to obtain a legal abortion, but the recommended clinic had been closed down by authorities. Her doctor, Dr. Richard Lane, suggested that she consult with Henry McCluskey, an adoption lawyer in Dallas. McCorvey stated that she was interested in an abortion, but agreed to meet with McCluskey. Eventually, McCorvey was referred to attorneys Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, who were looking for a pregnant woman who pregnant women who were seeking abortions. 
the case Roe v. Wade, Henry Wade was a district attorney in Dallas at the time, took three years of trials to reach the Supreme Court, and McCorvey never attended a single trial. During the course of the lawsuit, McCorvey gave birth and placed the baby up for adoption. McCorvey told the press that she was Jane Roe soon after the decision was reached, stating that she had sought an abortion because she was unemployable and greatly depressed. In 1983, McCorvey told the press that she had been raped. In 1987, she said the rape claim was untrue. So she was a really difficult client for being Roe versus Wade because she was always lying. She had been in juvenile detention centers. She was a drug addict and an admitted les- lesbian. There wasn't a lot of things that for her to be the poster child of this, this very successful case overturning uh, state laws banning abortion so uh consequently um you'll see later that they tried to hide her her attorneys and you didn't get to hear much about her she wasn't intentionally not in the public eye she was hidden from the public eye because she's exactly the kind of person that a lot of people would say that maybe she should have gotten the abortion i am not of the mind that she should have i think uh, particularly knowing that her child grew up adopted in what I believe was a happy home. But um, this didn't bode well for the the glamour of Roe versus Wade, having this person being their poster child for the case. So um, in 1994, McCorvey published her autobiography, I Am Roe. At the book signing, McCorvey was befriended by Flip Benham. An, ev- an evangelical minister and the national director of the anti-abortion organization Operation Rescue, she converted to evangelical Prot- Protestantism and was baptized in '95 um, in Dallas, Texas, in this man's backyard swimming pool, an event that was filmed for national television. Two days later, um, she announced that she had quit her job at. The- at the abortion clinic and become had become an advocate for Operation Rescue's campaign to make abortion illegal. She voiced remorse for her part in the Supreme Court decision and that she had been a pawn for the abortion activist. Um, in 1998, McCorvey was received into the Catholic Church in a mass celebrated by Father Edward Robinson and con celebrated by Father Frank Pavone, the director of priests at St. Thomas Aquinas in Dallas. McCorvey's second book, One by Love, described her religious conversion and was published in 1998. In the book, she said her change of heart occurred in 1995 when she saw a fetal development poster in Operation Rescue's office. In 2004, almost 10 years later, McCorvey sought to have U.S. Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade, saying that there was now evidence that the prosecution, the procedure harms women, but the case was ultimately dismissed in 2005. In 2008, McCorvey endorsed President, uh, presidential candidate Ron Paul because of his anti-abortion position. Um, McCorvey remained active in the anti-abortion demonstrations, including one where she participated in, in before President Barack Obama's commission uh, address to the graduates of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, McCorvey was arrested, and uh, and then her shenanigans went on and on. Um This goes on to say that soon after giving birth a third time in Roe v. Wade, that McCorvey met in a long-term relationship with Connie Gonzalez. They lived together in a lesbian relationship in Dallas for 35 years. After converting to Christianity, McCorvey continued to live with Gonzalez, though she described the relationship as platonic. Later in life, McCorvey stated that she was no longer a lesbian, although she later said that her religious conversion and renouncement of her sexuality were financially motivated. McCorvey moved out of the house she shared with Gonzalez in 2006, and shortly after, Gonzalez suffered a stroke. Uh, this goes on to say that McCorvey died of heart failure in Katy, Texas in 2017 at the age of 69. Um, there were some documentaries made about it, but um, she did go on to say that, uh, you know, I'm not going to read all of this, I've read enough of it, that basically um, 
most of the decisions that she made were financial in nature, that she was never invited to any of the Roe versus Wade hoopla and the fundraisers and the stuff that went on because they, the, the attorneys that represented her looked down upon her. She wasn't there when the decision, decision was made. She didn't even know when the decision came out uh, except for seeing it on TV. So they did not include her. She was simply used as a figurehead, and it's really kind of sad. And one other sidebar before we get to the actual uh, draft of this case is an article I read about Sarah Weddington. Sarah Weddington was one of the attorneys that recruited uh, Norma McCordy to uh, McCorvey to be the Jane Roe in Roe vs. Wade. And what's interesting about it is that they were basically the same age, except um, Norma McCorvey came from the wrong side of the tracks, and Sarah Weddington um, had an Ivy League education. But the women in, in politics and in law were still not uh, just like uh, with uh, the the Supreme Court justice that um, recently died, um, women in politics were not as well received or as accepted or even hired uh, back in the early 60s. And it was Ginsburg. That was the name I was looking for. And this goes on to say that um, another Texas gal, uh, Sarah Ragel, uh, she married, and her name became Sarah Catherine Regal Weddington. I was born in Abilene, Texas, in 1945. Um, she was in the uh, drum major. She, uh, you know, was uh, in a sorority. She went to the University of Texas. Uh, she was a member of a Sigma Kappa sorority. In 1964, she entered the University of Texas Law School, partly motivated after the dean of a junior college she went to told her that no woman from this college has ever gone to law school. It would be too tough. Um, she did. Uh, but what is interesting is that she was one of only five women in her law school class of 120 at University of Texas in 1964. And in 1967, during her third year of law school, Weddington became t pregnant by Ron Weddington, and she traveled to Mexico for an illegal abortion, a fact that she didn't reveal until 1992. She received her JD that same year in 1967 and after graduating in the top quarter of her class. So um, after graduating, uh, she found it difficult to find a job with a law firm. She joined a group of graduate students at the University of Texas, Austin, who were researching ways to challenge various anti-abortion statutes. Soon after, pregnant woman, Norma McCovey, visited a local attorney seeking an abortion. That attorney instead assisted McCorvey with handling, handing her over for an adoption, uh, over, handing over her child for adoption. After doing so, referred McCorvey to Weddington and Linda Coffey. That isn't how McCorvey says it. McCorvey says that she visited um, Weddington and Coffey in a coffee shop and while she was pregnant, begging for an abortion, and that they kept putting it off until it was too late to get an abortion anywhere. So she felt like she was used by them, which, of course, she was, because they wanted somebody to do the, be the figurehead for their case. In March of 1970, Weddington and her co-counsel, which is sort of ironic, because Weddington had gotten an abortion so that she could continue her law school and her, you know, she, she left the state and she could financially afford to do it, but she... McCorvey needed the help to get an abortion, but Weddington didn't help her. So um, anyway, this goes on to say that Weddington and her co-counsel filed suit against Henry Wade, the Dallas district attorney, and the person responsible for enforcing the anti-abortion statute. McCorvey became a landmark plaintiff and referred to his legal documents as Jane Roe to protect her identity, even though she said she didn't really care. Um, in May of 1917, Weddington first stated her case in front of a three-judge district court in Dallas, the federal court. The district court agreed that the Texas abortion laws were unconstitutional, but the state appealed the decision to the Fifth Circuit, and this is how it landed in the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1971, and again in the fall of 1972, Weddington appeared before the Supreme Court. Uh, the, uh, at the time of her Supreme Court presentation, Weddington was only, Weddington was only 26 years old, and had never tried a legal case. Her argument was based on the 1st, 4th, 5th, 8th, 9th, and 14th Amendments, as, as well as the court's previous decision in Griswold versus Connecticut, which legalized the sale of contraceptives based on the right of privacy. 
In January of 73, the court's decision was ultimately handed down overturning Texas abortion law, 72, legalizing abortion throughout the United States, at least in the first 15 weeks. But Corby, the league plaintiff, claimed at the time that, that she had been raped, although she later recanted that claim and said that she wanted an abortion for economic reasons. During the course of Roe v. Wade, she gave birth and put the baby up for adoption. Rape was never an issue in the litigation or in the Supreme Court decision. In a 1993 speech, um, Weddington discussed how she presented McCorvey during the lawsuit. My conduct may not have been totally ethical. This is the attorney for Roe v. Wade. But I did it for what I thought were good reasons. In a 2018 interview with Time, she said McCorvey was, quote, a changeable person, end quote, adding, the problem I had was trying to set, tell when I was telling the truth and when she wasn't. I was very careful in drafting the materials that were filled, filed with the court to be sure I only put in things I, sure, I was sure were accurate. So they never went into the background of McCorvey at all. Uh, they just basically laid the line that she was, that it was the, the privacy issue. That was their biggest argument. In 1989, Weddington was portrayed by, maybe, uh, by Amy Madigan in the television film Roe v. Wade. In 1992, Weddington compiled her experiences with the case in interviews with people involved in the book. Um, this goes on to say that um, she was only married to Ron Weddington from 68 to 74. After her divorce, Sarah continued to live alone in Austin, and there was some overtones that she uh, may also have been a lesbian. Um, Weddington died at her home in Austin in December on December 26, 2021. She just died a few months ago at the age of 76. After a period of declining health, news outlets noted that her death occurred shortly after the Supreme Court heard oral, oral arguments on the very case that would reverse her case. And um, so that's a little background on that, that it's, it was, she was simply arguing this case to, um, to make a statement, not to help McCorvey, um, not for what the reason that I believe it was ultimately overturned in this case or will be overturned in Dobbs v. Jackson. And um, the last thing I'll say about uh, Weddington, uh, that Coffey was also, uh, and I'm not sure if she is still alive or not, but she was also a lesbian. So all these women were lesbians. Um, Weddington went on to be, get into the Texas legislature. She did, the, my understanding, she was a very good uh, person uh, representing Texas um, in the, I think it was the Texas Senate for a short period. And then she went on to teach um, uh, in, as an adjunct professor in various law schools. But um, it was to me, it was wrong that she took the case for all the wrong reasons. And she kind of duped McCorvey um, because McCorvey just wanted an abortion. But anyway, um, all right, so here is the crux of the case that was released. You can find this case um, if you go to Politico and Google Dobbs v. Jackson, um, Supreme Court, United States. And the first draft is actually listed in an article that was published by Politico. And it really, it kind of tells you the, the gist of the case in the first couple of paragraphs. Um, Alito goes on to say that abortion presents a profound moral issue on which Americans hold sharply conflicting views. This is the actual Supreme Court case. Uh, for Dobbs, it's going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Some believe fervently that a human person comes into being at conception and that abortion ends an innocent life. Others feel just as strongly that any regulation of abortion invades a woman's right to control her own body and prevents women from achieving full equality. Still others in a third group think that abortion should be allowed under some, but not all, circumstances. And those within this group hold a variety of views from, a particular, from the particular restrictions that should be imposed. For the first time in 185 years after the adoption of the Constitution, each state was permitted to address the issue in accordance with the views of its citizens. This goes back to the Tenth Amendment that I was talking about that wasn't brought up in Roe v. Wade. Even though the Constitution makes no mention of abortion, the court held in Roe that it confers a broad right to obtain one. It did not claim that the American law or common law ever recognized such a right, 
and its survey of history ranged from the constitutionally irrelevant, e.g., its discussion of abortion in antiquity, which um, I guess that's what they did in Roe v. Wade. They went all the way back to, you know, the the laws that that uh, prevented abortion in the in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, for each state that prohibited, to the plainly incorrect, e.g., its assertion that abortion was probably never a crime under the common law, um, was, uh, so that's, I'm going to reread that sentence without the parentheticals because it's kind of an important sentence. Um, Roe did not claim that American law had ever recognized such a, a right of abortion. And its survey of history ranged from the constitutionally irrelevant to the plainly incorrect. And that is the assertion that abortion was probably never a crime. After cataloging a wealth of other information having no bearing on the meaning of the Constitution, the opinion concluded with a numbered set of rules, much like those that might be found in a statute enacted by a legislature. Under this scheme, each trimester of pregnancy was regulated differently, but the most critical line was drawn at roughly the end of the second trimester, which at the time corresponded to the point at which a fetus was thought to achieve viability, i.e. the ability to survive outside the womb. Although the court acknowledged the states had a legitimate interest in protecting potential life, it found that the interest could not justify any restriction on previous, uh, the, the, on previ, uh, this doesn't really, on previous, it's not even typed This is why this is a draft. On, this is probability abortions, and that doesn't make any sense. It would be previability abortions. Anyway, um, it goes on to say, the court did not explain the basis for this fine line after the second trimester. And, even abortion supporters have found it hard to defend Roe's reasoning. One prominent constitutional scholar wrote that he would vote for a statute very much like the one the court ended up drafting if he were a legislator. But his assessment of Roe was memorable and brutal. Roe was, quote, not constitutional law at all and gave almost no sense of an obligation to try to be one. At the time of Roe, 30 states still prohibited abortion at all stages. In the years prior to that decision, about a third of the states had liberalized their laws, but Roe abruptly ended that political process. And it opposed the same highly restricted regime on the entire nation and effectively struck down the abortion laws of every single state, um, at least as to the first trimester. As Justice Byron White aptly put in his dissent, the decision presented the exercise of raw judicial power, and it sparked a national controversy that has embittered our political court culture for a half century. Eventually, in Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey in 1992, the court revisited Roe, but the members of the court split three ways. Two justices expressed no desire to change Roe in any way. Four others wanted to overrule the decision in its entirety. And three remaining justices who joined signing the controlling opinion took a third position. And those justices were uh, Justice Stevens concurred in part and dissented in part. Concurring in part, concurring in part. So I'll just say Justice C Stevens uh, said they didn't, they were split. Uh, the ones that wanted to overturn it were uh, Rehnquist, who was still on the court. Wow, 50 years later. That's amazing. And Scalia. And the ones that wanted to, um, let's see, the four wanted to overrule it in its entirety were O'Connor, Kennedy, Souter, and Souter. Um, it says, uh, the opinion did not endorse Roe's reasoning uh, in the one from 1992 and even hinted that one or more of its authors might have reservations about whether the Constitution protects the right to abortion. But the opinion concluded that stare decisis, and that's what we were talking about earlier today, which calls for prior decisions to be followed in most instances, required 
an adherence to what is called Rose Central Holding, that a state may not constitutionally protect fetal life before viability, even if that holding was wrong, anything less, the opinion claim, would undermine respect for this court and the rule of law, which is the state's right to make decisions that aren't provided by the Tenth Amendment, which I will read briefly here. Uh, the Tenth Amendment reads in its entirety, and it's such an important, uh, I don't know why this one wasn't in the forefront of the first case, probably because they wanted to, we had a very liberal court, and they wanted to overturn it, and the Tenth Amendment would have prohibited that. The Tenth Amendment is one sentence. The state's, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people, and that would be the legislature for each state. So that's pretty much where we're going to be going with this case, obviously, by what they've said so far, and that uh, every state could uphold Roe if they want to make that law because it's a state right to make that decision. And the states that don't want to uphold it, like Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, the ones that have more strong abortion laws, that's their right as a state um, the people that are protesting right now are trying to make it a constitutional issue, and it's just simply not. And they've been saying that for like the last, since Roe came out. But for fear that, I guess, um, there would be an upheaval, I'm not really quite sure why it wasn't overturned for 50 years now that I'm actually reading the case uh, and this draft. But at any rate, um, it's a state's rights issue. Um, paradox that I'm going back to the draft opinion that was published by Politico that was written by Judge Alito. Uh, paradoxically, the judgment in Casey did a fair amount of overruling Roe. Several important abortion decisions were overruled in toto. Like, I guess that's Latin for in total. Um, and Roe itself was overruled in part. Casey threw out Roe, Roe, Roe's trimester scheme and substituted a new rule of uncertain origin under which states were forbidden to adopt any regulation that imposed an, quote, undue burden on a woman's right to have an abortion. So they made it even more complex. Um, the decision provided no clear guidance about the difference between a due and an undue burden. But the three justices who authored the controlling opinion called the contending sides of a national controversy to end their national their national. Uh, division by threatening the court's decision as the final settlement of the question of a constitutional right to abortion. So they kind of threw a wrench in the, the, the cog in the wrench, uh, uh, a, a cog in the wheel, a wrench in the fire. I don't know all the, I don't know what all those little, uh, I guess, uh, sayings are. Okay. As has become increasingly apparent in the intervening years, Casey did not achieve that goal. Americans continue to hold passionate and widely divergent views on abortion, and state legislatures have acted accordingly. Some have recently enacted laws allowing abortion with few restrictions at all stages of pregnancy. With uh, Others have tightly restricted abortion, beginning well above viability. And in this case, 26 states have expressly asked the court to overrule Roe and Casey and to allow the states to regulate or prohibit pre-viability abortions, which I'm in complete agreement with according to the Constitution. And I made the highest grades in constitutional law. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm not a scholar like these people, but they're saying what I've kind of been thinking even before I read it. Um, before us now is one state law. The state of Mississippi asks us to uphold the constitutionality of a law that generally prohibits an abortion after the 15th week of pregnancy, several weeks before the point at which a fetus is now regarded as viable outside the womb. In defending this law, the state's primary argument is that we should consider and overrule Roe and Casey and once again allow each state to regulate abortion as its citizens wish. On the other side, respondents and the Solicitor General ask us to reaffirm Roe and Casey, and they contend the Mississippi law cannot stand if we do so. Allowing Mississippi to prohibit abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, they argue, quote, would be no different than overruling Casey and Roe in its entirety, end quote. 
They contend that no half measures are available and that we must either reaffirm or overrule Roe and Casey, which is what they did. Um, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. That's the linchpin of this entire opinion. And he says this in, I don't, well, I don't know what page it is, but it says page five. And I'm going to give you the five-minute mark by Station Manager Day. And this is the holding that will go down. This Supreme Court said, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defendants of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, which is Washington v. Glucksburg in 1997, the Supreme Court. The right to abortion does not fall within this category. Until the latter part of the 20th century, such a right was entirely unknown in American law. Indeed, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, three-quarters of the states made abortion a crime at all stages of pregnancy. The abortion right is critically different from any right that this court has held to fall within the 14th Amendment's protection of, quote, liberty. Rose defenders characterized the abortion right as similar to the rights recognized in past decisions involving matters such as intimate sexual, sexual relations, contraception, um, and marriage. But abortion is fundamentally different, as both Roe and Casey acknowledge, because it destroys what those decisions called, quote, fetal life, and what the law now before us describes as, quote, unborn, an unborn human being. Stare decisis, in the document on which Casey's controlling opinion was based, does not compel unending adherence to Roe's abuse of judicial authority. Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak, and the decision has had damaging consequences. And far from bringing about a national settlement of the abortion issue, Roe and Casey have inflamed debate and deepened division. It is time to heed the Constitution's time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives of the states. The permissibility of abortion and the limitations upon it are to be resolved like most important questions in our democracy by citizens trying to persuade one another and then voting. And this is what uh, Justice Scalia, concurring in the judgment in part and dissenting in part, said in Casey. This is what the constitutional and the rule of law demand. So I'm loving Justice Alito's um, in entire opinion because he is going to strict and pure constitutional um, interpretation, which is what he should be doing, what the, the Supreme Court should be doing. They should not be of taking state law and making it federal law. They should not be taking legislative law and making it federal law and, and, and putting and trying to use um, judicial acrobatics uh, to uh, twist and turn it to make it work. That's not the way our Constitution works. Our Constitution should be upheld and it has been for well over 200 years. Uh, it, it should be used. And, and interpreted and applied when it actually does apply, not when somebody wants to make something work legally that doesn't work in any other field. This right was a legislative right. It should still be a legislative right, and it is a legislative right. And that's what the uh, state of Mississippi was doing, and that's what the state of Texas has done also with a, a similar, if not more, uh, a powerful uh, law. Um, the law at issue here in this case is Mississippi's Gestational Age Act, and, and it contains this central provision, quote, except in a medical emergency or in the case of severe fetal abnormality, a person shall not intentionally or knowingly perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human being if that probable gestation age of the human being has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks. This is not that different from Roe because it's, it's saying that the, the dividing line here is the 15-week mark. 
To support this act, the legislature made a series of factual findings. It began by noting that at the time of enactment, only six countries besides the United States um, uh, permitted non-therapeutic or elective abortions on demand after the 20th week. The legislature then found that five or six weeks gestational age and an unborn human being's heart begins beating. At eight weeks, the unborn human being begins to move in the womb. At nine weeks, all basic psychological functions are present. At 10 weeks, vital organs begin to function and hair, fingernails, and toenails begin to form. At 11 weeks, an unborn human being diaphragm is developing and he or she may move about freely in the womb at 12 weeks the unborn human being has taken on the human form in all relevant respects um quoting gonzalez versus carhart in the united states Supreme Court in 2007 it found that most abortions after 15 weeks employ uh, dilation and evacuation procedures that involve the use of surgical instruments to crush and tear the unborn child, and it is concluded that the intentional commitment of such acts for non-therapeutic or elective reasons is a barbaric practice, dangerous for the material patient and demeaning to the medical profession. And so the uh, the respondents at the abortion clinic and one of those were doctors brought this this case saying that the abortion law that they had brought forward was improper, where the facts of the state law in Mississippi are the fact findings were not disputed and they are good law. So um, we will have uh, Roe v. Wade part three to go on more about it because we've run out of time. Uh, so join us again next week for Roe v. Wade part three so we can talk about the uh, opinion, uh, opinion that Politico has, has published, although the Supreme Court hasn't come out with it yet. And remember, the most important thing that you can do is to serve God by serving others. We'll see you next week.